thank you very much. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just a bit disappointed. You, you're expecting me to, to match, <laughs> and and uh, I'll give it, I'll give it my best shot. But I, 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 I consider myself to having both hands behind the back. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Because I can't compete with space. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Maybe just to 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 set the scene. Um, my name is Romeo Adams, and I I started working. I've I'm a career public servant. So when I say career public servant, it's the small p and the small s because I haven't just been in, in, in a government department. Uh, I started off as a male nurse somewhere in Cape Town. And, and then eventually I, I realized that it was not for me. And I needed to look for some other avenues that I, that I wanted to explore. So I went to the University of the Western Cape. I thought I was going to be a career administrator. Um, and then, then eventually bumped into people management in organizations. The, the, the traditional phrase would probably be HR, human resources. I, I then, then decided it's probably the way I would want to explore. The alternative was going to be political science. And I uh, wasn't going to go down there. So I, I, I've been, like I said, I've been working in the public service for a bit more than 30 years. I've been around the country, I would like to think. So I'm initially from Cape Town. Um, you can tell. Is it? <laughs> okay. I'm initially from Cape Town, then I had a stint at the National Prosecuting Authority as the head of HR. Um, that was during the stage of the dissolution of the Scorpions, where I was expected to play a specific role as the head of HR. I then moved back to Cape Town to a public entity. I also had a stint in Limpopo. And I can tell you my experience from working in Limpopo is for those of us who live in the city, we, we take too many things for granted. I was in a, in a, in a rural area called Labuajo. And for the just over two years that I was there, I learned to, when you pass Shaprat, make sure that you buy the bottle of water. Because, and not the small bottle, the big four or five liter bottle of water. Because when you get to your residence, there may just not be water. And the people in those communities had accepted that to be a way of life. Um, we, we take for granted tar roads. I mean, your yaras would not survive in, in, in that rural area because it's going to fall apart at some stage because of the potholes, because of it's not tar roads and those type of things. So I then, I then, I'm currently employed at the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development. I'm the Deputy Director General responsible for corporate services. So HR is part of the area. I'm currently, well, I said I'm currently employed, but it would be until the end of this week. Then I move over to the Department of Correctional Services, where I will then be the head of HR for Correctional Services from next week onwards. So some people ask me if there's something wrong upstairs. <laughs> upstairs, I'll probably find out someday that there was something wrong upstairs, but it is what it is. Okay, I, I have a passion for, for employment matters. Um, the, the current phrase is probably human capital management Be, because it deals with more than just what we thought HR should be dealing with in, in, in the traditional sense. So I, I have a master's degree in industrial psychology. I'm currently a PhD student. Um, this is, is just to give the collective here a bit of insights in terms of where my study is going, what I'd like to, what I'm liking to explore, and I'm hoping to get quite a bit of valuable input. I think even I got one or two, three, four, five notes from even what Duncan had shared with us, and especially from the questions that, that were prompted that I think could add some value to, to my study. So, so we would, we would probably all recognize because it, it, you could probably call it a phenomenon these days. That service delivery and government service delivery has become quite a big issue. Um, even, even those who we had thought would never protest about service delivery are now starting to, to protest about service delivery. Because people are probably getting to become more aware of our rights, but that government actually has to deliver something. That's why taxes are being paid and, and all of the other things. It is, it, it is my view that the reason why, and it's my view, it may not be shared by, by other people. Some of, one of the reasons why we are struggling with service delivery is because we probably don't have the right people in the right place 
And when I say the right people, the people who bring the competencies that are, that are necessary. The previous um, AG, Auditor General of South Africa, for example, had previously raised when he was still the AG, that chief financial officers in government institutions lack some of the key competencies for them to be able to manage the budgets that they are expected to manage. How are you able not to deliver services yet at the end of the financial year, you are able to surrender funding back to the fiscus, knowing full well that we were supposed to, 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 to build houses, we were supposed to make sure that the roads are tarred, the Lubuachums in Limpopo are supposed to have adequate water supply and electricity supply, yet we are paying people to be able to do these things. Okay, so, so my, I think government has, has done a bit to, to make sure that some of the controls are in place. I mean, we have, we have the, the NDP, the National Development Plan 2030, that says, here's where we want to go, this is what we need to do. But the plan, the NDP 2030 in itself, is not going to get us there. We, we need to do so much more in order to make sure that those who are responsible for doing what they need to do are actually doing what they need to do. So, so I apologize if it sounds like I'm going off on a tangent. It's just that some of these issues really get some of us hot under the collar, especially me. So in around 20, 2006, um, the, the government had decided that maybe we are not recruiting the way we should be recruiting, and that would be the reason why we are not getting the right people in the right spots. Things may not have changed significantly, but at least that was a start. So in, in, that, in that era, the issue of competency assessment for senior managers was then brought uh, uh, on board. Obviously, there was a bit of a testing what's happening in the open market, what are the private sector doing. So let's see whether we could, whether we could, could also duplicate that in the public service. It, it is my view, and I said 2006, so we're into 2018, which is 12 years later, that, that it may just have been a tick box exercise. I've been a senior manager in government since 2003, which is around, what is it, 15 years? And it's always been in HR. And my experience has always been that when we need to recruit, we know competency assessment is something that we have to do, but so what? Now you get the results, and I can tell you from my experience, some of the results would have said that Mr. X or Mrs. Y is struggling. Not there's areas for development that will get the person to where the person needs to be. But he's struggling, and the competency assessment has revealed that they are struggling, but we still make the appointment. And I use the we loosely, it's the royal we for now. We still make the appointment because firstly, we are probably hoping that something is going to change and the competency assessment may not have been as accurate. I've, I've had the experience in the past three years that the competency assessment has said X is going to struggle in the area of management. Lo and behold, in the three years up to now, <laughs> we've experienced that. But it was something that you could have you could have informed the decision maker without even even sending the person on the competency assessment because of the behaviour, because of the performance uh, monitoring monitoring tools that were in place. Okay, and that's why the reason why I've decided that this is probably the research that I would want to do is that hopefully at the level that I am, I would like to think I have a bit of, a bit of influence, not just in the department where I'm working in, but across, across government, and, and that the study would be able to tell us that yes, the idea of competency assessment was a good idea. But if you're not going to implement it the way it should be implemented, then you're just wasting money and, and, and you're not going to change the results. And I mean, we, we are, what, 24 years into our democracy. And, and we would have seen over the past years the issue of service delivery has become more and more emphasized. If you look at the, at the AG's report recently, um, even in municipalities, there's issues, there's problems with, and remember, a municipality is the, the, the closest point to where service delivery needs to happen. There's issues with service delivery, uh, irregular and, and fruitless and wasteful expenditure and, and those type of things. Okay? So, so, so that's the basic background to, to, to the study that, that I'm doing. The, the, the intended outcome of the study, like I've indicated, is hopefully I'll be able to develop a framework 
that would be acceptable across government. And, and the reason why I'm saying I, I would like to think I have a bit of influence, although I'm working in the Department of um, Justice and Correctional Services, I've, I've been doing a bit of work for other government departments, the Office of the Chief Justice in, in terms of the HR, even the Department of Public Service and Administration, um, I've been assisting a bit with the with the with the bargaining, the collective bargaining, and 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 in the recent in the recent um, or the current, well, the just concluded negotiations. I I uh, I played quite a quite a bit of a role in terms of that area. So I think those experiences would probably let people then sit up and listen if I am able to put something on the table for, for them to then consider going forward. Because I, I really think we need to get to a solution where, where and you've, I think you've mentioned the, the, the phrase fit for purpose. Where, where, where we got to, we, we are going to have to get the right people. Otherwise, we're just going, going nowhere and the money is just going to go down, down the drain. Okay, so, so the aim of my research study is basically to examine the intended use of competencies as part of the talent management um, strategy, both nationally, but also internationally. And when I say internationally, is look at what is the benchmarks that has been happening across uh, across the, the 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 globe, and 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 I've basically used my literature review um, to look far and wide in terms of those areas to analyze the role of managers during competency-based talent management, because. The, the, other than using a, a documentary analysis and research in, in, my, in, my, in my data gathering, I don't think that the people that I need to interview are the people that have been appointed. I, I think that the people that I need to interview and the people that need to add to the, to the data collection are the managers that have actually been part of those processes. Because you see, I think that the manager has a key role to play in, in when, when there's a post that we are recruiting for, surely the line manager needs to know what do we need in order for the business, for the business to be done and for the work to happen. The person coming in is going to have to meet those requirements and, and therefore I've decided on rather um, um, as part of my data gathering techniques to do interviews with, with the managers. I've, I've, I've also decided to take from the 2013, 2014 financial year. So it's 2014, 20, 2013, 14, 2014, 15, 2015, 16. And the reason why I've decided to take those three financial years is because we are in currently in 2018. The people that have been, that would have been appointed in those three financial years would have at least completed one full performance management cycle. So best case scenario, I would get candidates or managers that would be able to input into, into the data for, for their recruits that would have completed three years of the performance management cycle because they could then also add value during the data collection by saying, when I had thought that this is what we've needed when we had recruited for the individual. My experience now with the individual that's in place in terms of managing the performance of the individual, but also managing the unit that they, or looking at the unit that the person is, is managing. I've now seen that yes, we've gone the right way or no, we've gone, we've gone the, right, the wrong way. Because our recruitment techniques or acquisition techniques have, have aimed to give us a certain product because of what we had thought we needed, but the product that we actually needed was something different. And, and that has been my experience, okay? Um, and the reason why, why I've also decided to go as far back as 2013, 2014, is that I didn't want the, the sample to be too small. It, it, it is a case study type of exercise because I'm doing, using one, one government department and, and therefore I thought that if we go as far back as 13, 14, I might get quite a bit of managers that would be interested and, and managers that could form part of the sample. So in terms of the number of employees, and, and maybe just to indicate, these are all senior managers that would have been recruited. So a senior manager is defined as everybody from a director upwards. So it would be a director at salary level 13. They currently earn, well, just below a million a year. It would then also be the next level, a chief director level, which would be 1.3 million a year. 
and then also the level that I'm currently at, which, which would not be that much, but uh, they would currently earn X amount. I'm not going to say what the amount is. <laughs> and that's why you were, you were thinking. You were thinking I was going to disclose. Okay? So, so just roughly, it would just be below 1.5 million that deputy director generals would be earning. So if you compare that to, uh, to, to me, to the private sector, we don't earn a lot of money. Okay? And, and, and that, is the, that, is the, that is the area that I'm looking at. Um, I've, I've looked at what the population entails. And, and the population is around about 35 individuals, okay? But, but what, what, what counts for, what probably counts in my favor is when I've done an assessment of who are the managers for these 35 individuals, I got to 21 individual senior managers, which, which in terms of my research, anything from 20 upwards would probably be a reasonable type of type of sample to use. Uh, I'm just hoping that all of them, all 21 of them, would be, would be willing and able to assist. So I've done a bit of testing the water, and, and from, 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 from all of them that I've tested, they seem to be quite keen to, to, to assist with the data collection in terms of the semi-structured interviews. Um, and and, 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 and I've, I've, I've started with scheduling the, the interviews from the month of, of July. I'm, I'm hoping that in the month of July and August I would be able to deal, de deal with, the, with the interviews. If we come to the data collection techniques, I've indicated it's the semi-structured interviews, but, but I've also thought it necessary to, to look at documentary evidence. So, so I've, I've collated or I've collected the, the strategic plan of the department. So the street strategic plan is usually a five-year plan. In this case, it is from 2014 to 2019. There's obviously been a few amendments um, in, in, in that area. The current one that we have would be the 20, 2015 to 2020. And the reason for that is um, the, the electoral system. Our electoral system means that in 2019, we would have a national and provincial elections which means that in 2019 we will have a new administration. That new administration, because the period is five years, would then work on a five-year strategic plan from 2019 up to 2024 in terms of their, their term of office. Okay? Um, I'm, also, I'm also looking at um, the performance, like I've indicated, the performance agreements of, of the individuals that have been appointed for all of the years starting from 2013. Obviously, if somebody was only um, employed in 2014, 2015, then the number of performance agreements that I would have would be less than somebody who had actually started in, in, 20, in 2013, 2014. Um, I'm, almost, I'm also assessing, I'm also assessing the, the training and development plans of those individuals. Because if you, look at, if you look at talent management, and maybe I'll touch on the issue of talent management, it, it's not just the acquisition and performance management. There's also the issue of development and retention and whether there are scarce skills in the environment and so on. And then maybe the last, the last document or the last two documents that I'm looking at is on, on an annual basis, the, the Auditor General does a statutory audit, not just on how the finance is being managed, but also how the organization has performed in terms of the key, the key indicators, performance indicators. For, for, for our department, we've, we've, we've improved substantially over, over the period that I'm assessing to such an extent where in 2016, 2017, which is the, the last publicized annual report, um, we, had, we had exceeded the 80% in terms of the performance targets. And, and in government, anything above 75% is considered, is considered, let's call it highly acceptable, because there are variables within a performance period that changes. Either the budget has to be diverted to other priorities that come on board, which means that the plan that you've put in place at the start of the financial year is then somewhat thrown in, in, in disarray in terms of those areas. If you look at, for example, in 20, was it in 2016, 2017, the issue of, of fees must fall. It had suddenly just, just arisen. 
and, and government then had to intervene, which then affected the plans of government departments, where there was then a dramatic cut in terms of resources that, that we are currently still grappling with in terms of the cuts that have been, have been implemented. Okay, um, I, 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 I'm intending to, 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 in terms of the semi, the semi-structured interviews, like I've indicated, it would be the 21 individuals that have been identified, and 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 the reason why it's semi-structured is that I, I, and the literature also says that for a, for a qualitative assessment, for a qualitative analysis and research, try not to, to be too boxy. To want to box the, the the respondents into what answer you want, allow them for a bit of flexibility to to explore their, their responses, and and also make sure that you, like I've indicated, don't limit them to an area. It it can't just be a tick box approach because then then it can't be a PhD a PhD dissertation or, or thesis. It 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 may just not add the value that we would want it to add in, in, in terms of the research. So like I've said, it would be semi-structured interviews. Um, I'm, I'm envisaging that it would probably take about 60 minutes to 90 minutes in, in, terms, of the, in terms of the interviews. It, it, the interviews it, it will be recorded, digitally recorded, because I, I, I have, and I've discussed it with my supervisor, I, I think the Atlas TI um, software tool is probably something that would assist me in terms of the coding of the information that comes from, from, from that area and also it will probably save me on the manual coding in, in terms of time, time and effort. I, I realize that the, the digital, digital recording and for those of us who've, who've dealt with transcripts, there's, there's no 100% guarantee that when you give the recording to a transcriber, that that everything will be there. There's we we always need to manage the risk that there might be gaps in the in the transcriptions and the recordings, and therefore I, I will also be taking notes in terms of the interviews because I think the notes and the note taking would also be able to assist me that when I actually read the transcriptions, I can then see whether whether the transcriptions are consistent with the notes and my thinking at the time. I, I also think the notes would assist me in 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 assessing, because the transcriptions will not be able to, to, to do that, assessing maybe the demeanor of the, of the respondent, the, the, the body language, the, the, the non-verbal cues that, that comes from the, from the respondent, because it's been my experience uh, as a practitioner that, that what we say is not always what our body tells, what our body says. Okay, and I think it's important that we're then going to have to match the what I've said or what the respondent has shared with what does the body cues say. Because again, I, I don't think it adds value if somebody agrees to be to participate in the interviews, but I sit there because so so when is this interview finishing? Okay, it it must be a value a value add exercise. Otherwise, it doesn't doesn't get me or anybody else any any further. Um, <coughs> Maybe just in terms of one of the other the other research objectives um, is is to explore the significance attached to competencies during the talent management talent management process and and maybe if we can if we can go to the talent management process maybe just I was told it doesn't usually get done this way I've I've made a few copies of the paper so maybe just before we leave you could I, we could share the copies of the paper for people who want to who, who find it interesting. <laughs> who, who find it interesting um, and, and want to do a, a, a bit of a bit of extra reading um, um, maybe just I, I the, the research says that talent management is about <clears throat> talent acquisition and we're not talking about recruitment and selection talent acquisition talent development um, employee performance management workforce retention succession planning and then also compensation management. So, so when I say talent acquisition, talent acquisition is not just about there's an advert and we need to recruit for, for that vacant post. It can't be about that. It has to be about planning what we want and why we want what we want. Because, and, and, and I don't know, some, the colleagues in, in the room might have the experience, you sometimes get to an organization or you've been in an organization and you see they're recruiting 
but walk past the person desk and you were wondering so why did we get this person again <laughs> okay and then when the reports are due you see in the area where that individual has been appointed but the performance does not really show an upward trajectory in terms of the areas that we that that we have recruited so the acquisition also looks about why do we need and where are we going to find what we need okay because the shotgun approach of advertising whether it be online or in the national newspaper sometimes just don't get us what we want and and I've I've in the past 3 weeks I've been part of a recruitment process for a specific executive level position and we we had 176 applications 140 of those were people who just left a a a tertiary institution 176 140 so that probably tells us the, the the need for jobs out there okay but in terms of the process that we that we had then followed it was clear that it may not have been the correct process that we because if 140 out of 176 are people who just leave where you actually need um, at least senior management experience there's something wrong with the way where you are recruiting okay so that is also in in terms of the talent acquisition that's also what what i'm trying to look at when we get to the development it it's it's also about for who do we develop are, are we developing for and for when do we develop are we developing for the year and now because the world changes at some stage is probably going to send you a picture <laughs> remember that question that romeo had asked there's proof <laughs> and then the world changes and all of our needs changes and we have to think differently so in in terms of talent development it's probably also necessary that we look at the year and now but that our focus is more on what's going to happen going into the future but because remember we we are not just looking at at our own environment the world changes around us and and if we are not going to want to change the change is going to happen to us by force Okay, and um, there's 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 a saying that okay. Does anybody have a Nokia? <laughs> you see, nobody has a Nokia. But a few years ago, we would probably all have had Nokias, and and the world has changed so that we have. I'm not going to say what this. Oh, we have the same. We have the same phone. You probably just have the upgrade. But <laughs> but we we not we not even thinking about Nokias anymore. because been there done that got the t-shirt the cap the socks and everything else we we've moved past nokia and and that is how development employee development probably also needs to happen because if my employee is going to think of me in the year and now at some stage i'm going to move past the year and now and then i'm going to want to move on and and i think that's probably what i've also taken from 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 the input is 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 that they're not just focusing on you guys are not just focusing on the year and now and and your employees probably see that and and therefore the technical people would be more willing to stay yes the project manager would go because of bigger exposure when i come back to the organization i could get bigger projects because of the experience that i picked but the technical people are seeing we are going somewhere and in in the company going somewhere i will also be going somewhere probably uh, more more often than not when we look at employee performance management in in government employee performance management is tick box approach i i can tell you when i started at a certain department 76% of the employees in that department in the first year were nominated for performance bonuses and i couldn't understand why 76% because you see what what you have to do is and this is where we probably lack sometimes in government is we fail to see whether there's a correlation between employee performance performance of the unit that they are working in and then performance of the organization because if 76% of a department is being nominated for performance bonus surely there must have been an epiphany somewhere in that organization in terms of that component that had made that had made the organization move the elephant quickly into a different direction okay and and therefore i think performance management is probably employee performance management is probably one of the key critical areas that as government we still have a lot of work to 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 do in in terms of getting the individual the the the, the paradigm they they probably also needs to be a major paradigm shift because i have the issue of entitlement that i'm grappling also with 
I'm, I'm here, I've done what I needed to do, I need to get a performance bonus because I was here. Okay, it's not about what significantly. <laughs> you, you, you laugh, sir, but it, it's, it's my reality. And, and it's not in, just in the current department that I'm in. I've, I've been in the public service since 1988. And I've probably been across, and he tells me I have five minutes, I haven't even gotten to. <laughs> I, and, and, and I've been in the public service since 1988, and I've been in 12 sectors in the public service. From education, to health and social development, even in the legislative sector, and all of those other areas, tourism. And, and it's not different in the sectors. It, it's, the same, it's the same area, and that has probably also spurred me on to, to do this research, okay? I'm gonna jump quickly to, to the issue of of the research methodology, seeing that I have five minutes. I'm sure you'll give me a bit more time than just the five minutes, okay? Um, in, in, in terms of the, the research methodology, like I've indicated my sample, I've, done, uh, I've dealt with some of, some of the areas in, 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 in my input to date. Um, I, I, I am hoping that the data collection and, and especially the interviews because I've, I've picked up that, that the managers who who've, I've now identified from the colleagues are, are quite experienced managers, which means that they are either at the second tier of SMS or at the third tier, which means they've come through being a director, being a deputy director that's a middle manager. And, and, and I feel that the value that they will add to the process, if my questions are structured correctly, will get us to the solution of putting a framework and a model in place that would be acceptable across the board and everybody else would be, would be able to deal with that. Okay. Um, in, in terms of the data analysis, I think it's also important, and that's why I've used the Atlas, Atlas TI, is that my analysis would be a content analysis type, type of approach. Okay? And, and when I say content analysis, it, it would be looking at what, what in, in the thinking and in the responses, what were the phrases that were used by, by the respondents in, in, in terms of them giving me their reality of the experience with the talent management process in, in, in the area. Um, I think also, well, the, the, the research, uh, the literature says that qualitative content analysis is described as a research method which aims to subjectively interpret the content of the data collected during the study through the process of coding, which ultimately results on the identification of themes and patterns in the responses. Now, now because the, the sample and the respondents, in my view, is quite experienced in, in terms of the area of management, I, I am quite confident that they will, I'd be able to identify a golden thread in, in terms of the responses. Maybe because because their, their, their management acu acumen should also be tested during, during the interviewing process. And based on that, we, we should be able to get to get quite a bit of quite a bit of feedback. Don't tell me how much time I'm, I've left. <laughs> the, the the issue of of in 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 quantitative analysis, the issue of validity and reliability plays quite a big role. In in qualitative analysis, we, you could probably say it's also an issue of validity and reliability, but it's more about the trustworthiness. Of, of, of the responses and the data that has been, that has been collected, and, and how then do you, do you make sure that the research outcome then has some value to add in terms of that? Because if there's no trustworthiness in the data collection, then, then your research basically goes down the drain. But because if, if the research and, and the outcome of the research is probably less Credible, if I can, I can use that word, but because if there's no trustworthiness in your research, remember the trustworthiness also, also relates to if a similar research study is done, then then roughly the similar type of results should also should also be be be, be coming from that research, and therefore the trustworthiness focuses on the credibility. It focuses on the transferability. It focuses on the confirmability, and finally, the, the dependability of, of the research and, and, the, and the data that is that is being collected. Okay. In terms of the limitations of the study, um, and, and I'm going to have to rush before I get a thing here in my in my rib. Um, I, the, the, some of the limitations of the study probably will be the time it will take for the data collection. Um, re remember, I've, I've given you an indication of, of the documents. 
Now, if we're looking at between three and five years, okay, in terms of annual performance plans, in terms of, of, of performance agreements, performance assessments, and those type of things, and even service delivery improvement plans, the documents are quite voluminous. Okay, but so there, so there will be a bit of time, time issues there. It, it is also about, although I'm doing the study in the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development, the, the issue of, of the, like I've indicated, the, the trustworthiness of the, of the information and the data being gathered would, would be a big issue because if that becomes a limitation, it makes it a bit difficult to say, but if this happens in the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development, can we reasonably then say it could happen in, in any of the other uh, the departments? Um, the fact that it's a semi-structured interview, it could also be considered a, a limitation. And when I say semi, semi-structured, you wouldn't want to put the respondents in the box, like I've indicated, but you also don't want to give them the, the, the thinking that I actually have five hours to sit here. So I can tell from when Jan van Riebeek landed until when Exo X or Y, Y happened. In, in terms of the ethical considerations, and I'm concluding now, the, <laughs> the, the ethical, con, I, I just need to affirm every time that he is still in charge. The, the ethical considerations, like with any, any research, um, there needs to be informed consent. Okay, I, I, I've already dealt with the issue of the, the, the respondents. I've already started to engage the respondents. I, I've already also gotten permission up front from the head of the department so that the research could be conducted in the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development. I think I've actually gone an extra step. I've also alerted the Department of Public Service and Administration, the department that's responsible for, for employment practices within government as a whole. I've alerted them to the study that I've, 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 I've embarked on and asked also for their insights in terms of focus areas and, and those type of, so I would like to think that I have, I've, I've got the permission. Um, the, the literature says that one of the key issues of under ethical considerations is, is probably the, un, especially if it's semi-structured and unstructured interviews, is probably the unintended and unanticipated risk of harm that could, that could be caused during the data collection. When, when you give some of us an opportunity in a semi-structured environment to, to air our views, to relate our experiences, we, we, we sometimes forget to focus, and I'm using again we as a royal we, and sometimes it then, it then goes into an opportunity where I could probably now vent also. I can use it as a, as a venting opportunity. And, and although we would not want to, well, we would probably want to limit those type of venting, it, it, it could, if it's used, it's the proverbial opening the can of worms. Would the researcher and then myself, would, if the can of worms is opened, would I be able to deal with the can of worms and then, and then to close the can of worms? And I think that is probably my biggest, my biggest, issue that I'm grappling with. Because in, in some cases it would be my peers, in, in, in some cases it would be the colleagues that would report to my peers, and I think it, it's probably important that a, a secure environment is, is created, and that also that the respondents understand that it's a secure and safe environment, and there is the issue of confidentiality and anonymity. And, and therefore I've chosen that my questionnaire would identify biographical information, but it, it, I'm trying to stay away as far as possible for the identification of, but this is this person and that is that person. So that even when I move on, and uh, one, of the, one of the conditions that, uh, that permission has been granted is that a report also be made available to the department, which is probably, or you could consider it standard practice. So I don't want to expose any of the respondents, and that's why I'm thinking that that, that would probably be the way to go. Um, Mr. Facilitator, maybe just in conclusion, I'd like to thank, <laughs> and, and I, maybe just to tell you, I, I, I tend to read body language, okay? I, 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 I would like to say, sir, that that I, I may have come a distant second, 
but but I think that uh, that there was a bit of interest in the room too, Different. even from you, <laughs> with, the, with with the input that I've given. But I'd like to thank everybody for 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 listening to my to 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 my input. I trust that the questions that you will be asking will be well. I know that the questions that you will be asking would add value to my research, and maybe also thanking to Da Vinci, thank to Da Vinci Tsepo okay. for providing this opportunity. All right, Janet. So um, I'm, I've got. Five questions that I'm going to give you to think about. You don't necessarily have to answer. Yes. Um, but I have to also say one little thing on here that you are the very first person that I've ever met who has a similar background to me and is involved in human capital development. I also was a nurse many years ago. <laughs> Show us some happy. We are special people. I'm beginning to see, I'm beginning to see CPR in you. Just seeing as I'm slightly yeah. yeah. uh, abilities. So here's a couple of questions. First of all, what I'm very curious about is that what is your scope of definition of competence or competencies? Um, and, and just the thought around that is competencies versus qualifications. And from a whole person perspective, Rome, which I think you'll understand that concept out of a nursing background, you know, where the competencies begin and end would be something that I would be very curious about. Uh, second is also just a comment. I am very impressed by what I see in that I really see very strong qualitative inductive kind of reasoning which is, I don't know what this framework is going to look like. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's my question is what on earth is this framework going to look like? Um, what is it for? Is it around assessment, decision making, staff development, all of those kind of questions? Mm -hmm. But I'm sure that that will emerge. Um, your content analysis, just a comment, I've been doing a little bit of content analysis from my masters and it's just a warning. That can be a never ending story. <laughs> um, and then I think uh, one thing that, that just concerns me, especially in your environment, is the question of, let's, start, let's call it cliche responses, but it goes beyond that. Um, Einstein is, is credited with having said that you can't solve a problem at the same level of thinking that you created the problem. Mm. And that would be my very big concern in your environment, is that in mining the data from existing managers, are you going to actually end up with something that is truly going to take you into new solutions? That, that would just be the one question that I have. There was one more. In, in, in government, there's a, there's a competency framework. So for, for SMS members, there's about 11 competencies that have been identified. It would be process competencies and, and, and what is the, oh, the core competencies and then the, the process competencies that makes up the 11. So, so my focus is those 11 competencies. So the, 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 the boundaries, I would like to think, have already been defined in terms of the competencies. So those would be the 11 competencies that I'm, that I'm looking at. Because when, those, when, when the 30-odd senior managers were recruited, those were the competencies that, they were, that, that was used to recruit them. It is, it is not the technical competencies, but it's the management competencies. So it looks at strategic capability and leadership program management and, 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 and project management, the communication, the, the um, people management and empowerment and, and those type of things. So, so those are the competencies. So ideally, uh, the framework would, have, would, would, I would like to think, would say that if, if these are the competencies that government will be, will be using in terms of the competency framework, this is how you could be using the competencies in terms of the five elements of, of talent management. Both from, well, starting from the acquisition right down to, to compensation management. In, in terms of compensation management, it's a bit more limited in government than in, in, in the private sector in terms of the, the legislative and regulatory environment. Um, 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 limits the the way compensation is is looked at within within government in itself. But in and and I think that probably answers your question also competencies versus qualifications. But because the competencies have already been defined in the competency framework, it it does not go to the qualification. It looks at what are what are the skills, the attributes, and your experience that you bring to the job. And and in in the case of senior managers. The, the prescripts are quite clear that you need to have a minimum qualification level in order for you to qualify for all three, well, the four levels, 
in in senior management in in government. So I don't I, I don't think it, looking at qualifications would would necessarily assist me rather than looking at the competencies because I I also think that that the tools and even the documents that have been collating the performance agreements the uh, annual performance plans the annual annual report of the department lo looks more towards the competencies and will give me an idea of the competencies of the individuals within their specific areas rather than the qualifications um, I, I I hear you when when you say the content analysis could be and and <laughs> and, and never ending because you see once you once you once you think that you okay I've got I've got this done now then then in reading through it again and going through it again you then something else then pops up that you would want to explore again in in that specific area Can you just clarify Romeo I said content analysis but I actually mean document analysis Yeah I mean I mean I, I, you in in my input I had given an indication of the voluminous nature of the document itself and, and if you are not going to set yourself a framework for how am I going to analyze these documents, you, you're going to be forever looking at, at, at analyzing and going back and coming back. Um, I think the, the cliched, the cliched um, responses, um, and, and, and that's the reason why I did not just want to do the semi-structured interview. But because if a supervisor tells me that if we are talking about employee X, and the supervisor tells me about the recruitment process for employee X, uh, the acquisition part thereof, and then the performance management and the others, then the documents, the recruitment documents, the performance management documents of that employee will then tell me that, no, but the documents are not saying what the supervisor is actually saying. If the supervisor says, um, we're using performance management for this specific employee, like one, two, three, four, because we think it's a valued employee that we would like to retain it as a scarce skill. Then surely the documents that I am, I am sourcing from the organization needs to speak to, to that too. And I'm then hoping to use the documents as a, as a control to also look at what, what I get from the, from the semi-structured interviews. This, I mean, your paper is, 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 is meant to be qualitative. And I'm just wondering if you do not want to maybe use certain excerpts of quantitative, you know, I, I took note when you spoke about, you know, competence assessment that takes place before somebody gets appointed. And then at a later stage, you know, there's no performance. I'm not sure if you might maybe want to have that as some mining data, maybe as part of background or lit you know, literature review as you know, the, you know the, the contrast or, or the analysis between competence assessment and the scorecard competence. Yeah, that was just a, com um, a comment from my side. Okay. What is this gap that you've identified in the discipline? Because in the, you've mentioned a number of discipline or sub-discipline in your presentation. What is the gap that you believe your study would uh, um, be filling? And then, thirdly, when you when you do a PhD dissertation, you're not only writing for South African audiences; you're writing for international audiences. What do you think the international academics and other practitioners would get from your research? I needed to have the passion; otherwise, I would not have been been at the stage where I am at. Given things happening in the work environment and the, the family responsibility and, and those type of things. And I think when I started with, with the introduction to, to the PhD, that's what Da Vinci also said. If you don't have the passion, you might as well leave because you're not going to survive. Okay? In, in terms of the research problem, okay, and, and I, I apologize if I'm not as eloquent, but, but I think there's, there's a problem with the way government is using competencies in the way they manage senior managers. In the way they? They, they, they manage senior, ma or the talent of senior managers. So the, the way yeah. they're managing managers using yeah, the yeah. Re re Remember, I, in, my, in, in my input, I had said that I, I still think we don't have the right people in the right place with the right competencies. Okay. And, and, and I'm saying that is a, a, an outcome of the fact that we are not, not, not 
using competencies correctly when we when we when we acquire the the talent but it's not just about acquiring the talent it's also about through the talent management phases the other elements because once you've acquired like I've indicated, the, the, the 50 odd people are probably staying there because they're doing something right. And, 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 and that is the way, they might not use the word talent management, but that is the way they are managing their talent in order to retain the core competencies that is needed. I, I am, to me, I am hoping that, that the framework, like I've indicated, would deal with the issue, but firstly, the research would identify where are the areas that we that we are problematic in terms of our talent management as it relates to competencies, but then also hopefully providing a solution to how do we, where do we need to intervene and what should be the intervention in that area, okay? Cu currently, we, we get told that there's a list of service providers, okay, that you can use for competency assessment just as part of the recruitment phase. Like I've said, my, my, my experience has been, it, well, and maybe this can be tested by some, some other research or some other colleagues in the room. When you go to a department and you ask the department, so show me the competency assessment of somebody that's been appointed here at senior management level three years ago. What have you done about these results? You probably more often than not gonna find out, oops, we may not have done anything about it yet, or we've, doing, we've been doing something here, we've been doing something there, but it's not the holistic approach to talent management in terms of using the competencies. I don't know if I'm answering your question. No, look, I think for, you know, in, in, in platforms like, uh, like this, we are like a mirror to you. You know, as you are presenting, you're using us as a mirror. The most important thing, I think, for you is that is the research problem clear to you, mm. such that would anyone, when they read your paper, they would get a sense that this is the problem, and then this is what contribution you're making. Mm. So it's important for, for you, it's like we are like mirrors to mm. you, reflecting what you are saying. Quite a so lot the of most mirrors. important thing is whether, is it clear to mm. you? Have we helped you enough to clarify for you and for the readers of mm. the future paper to say this is the problem that you're researching. And then also in terms of the gap, mm. what gap are you filling in the discipline? Mm. Okay. Yeah. Mark, you wanna well, funny, the last like, question? If you, if you insist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, you say you, you're using qualitative uh, research. Um, so that, that talks to maybe exploratory research, um, which then talks to in-depth. Um, but I, you didn't talk about hypothesis. Um, so normally there would be a hypothesis somewhere, somewhere in there, I would imagine. So it's, it's um, I, I, I didn't see that. Maybe that's something to consider going forward in, instead, of, instead of your research questions or in addition to your research questions. And perhaps you can put some of your assumptions in, in that paper. Um, but the other question I have, final question, is, is um, you say you, re you don't know whether they uh, are recruited, um, well, they don't have the competencies, or perhaps the, the competencies haven't been um, updated or, or, or grown or developed. Uh, are they are they recruited with the right skills? So the people you say in the departments who don't have those competencies, do they have the skills, um, or they are they missing both? In my in my first draft, just the hypothesis. In 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 my first draft. I, I had, I think it was probably three hypotheses, okay. and, and it related to the, to the research question. Mm -hmm. but, but I think in my discussion with the supervisor, it, it, it tended to lean towards having an answer to the question. So it had a, you, you were showing your bias. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and, and that's where I, we, we had then thought that let, let's deal with the research question. And, and then see then what comes from, from the research question and the data that has been collected, because I think uh, Tumi had also, also indicated, it, it can't be that I already think I know what the answer is. But you do. No, no. <laughs> it, it depends on what the, Mark, it depends on what the question is. <laughs> it's important in your paper, you do have a bias, it's important in your paper to yeah. say what it is. Yeah. So yeah. By, yeah. by putting it out yeah. there, when yeah. people, yeah. When, when you do your yeah. this is what I yeah. think, but I'm, 
hoping that I can yeah, improve yeah. on that. M maybe, and, and for those of you who would be interested in taking the 21-page document, it, it, I, I think some of my biases comes out, of, out in, in that paper. And, and it's mainly probably because of I've been in the public service. And, and I, I, I always like to say, uh, it might be right or wrong, that although I've been in the public service for more than 30 years, I don't want to be accused of thinking like a public servant. I, I'm always on the lookout for how do we change things so that, so that we improve. And, 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 but like I say, if, if for those of you who would be reading through, through the colloquium paper, you'd probably pick up some of the biases. And, and maybe you'd even pick up that you, say, you, you said, Mark, that, but I do have an answer. That somewhere there would be a train of thought that I probably think this should be the answer. But, but uh, in, to mitigate the bias, I would rather want to be as open for, for new information coming through the data collection mm -hmm. methods, whether it be the questionnaires or the question, the interviews or, or the data collection, so that it enriches the, mm -hmm. the, the, the document. Now, I think everyone has an answer to their research uh, in the back of their mind. I think what's important is that you, you, know, you know that you are have a bias and that you, in your paper you are focused on mitigating yeah. uh, the bias yeah. of being more objective. Yeah. Oh, he, want, he wants to have your time. You, you, you asked the last question to me, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just, just a question from, from your side uh, to remove bias. Are you doing any benchmarking from an international version view of management of managers, senior management and government? The, the, the benchmarking is a, 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 a desktop type of benchmarking. In, in the literature review I've picked up in, in, in Asia, even lo and behold in, in, in the US, there, there's been a bit of research in terms of competency-based talent management. And, and, and I, I initially had not thought of using the managers of the people that have been recruited as as, as the subjects of the semi-structured interview. But from reading that, reading that literature, I had found that it would be more valuable to use the managers rather than those people that have been, uh, that were recruited. Mm -hmm. so, so the short answer is yes, it's not a, a physical benchmarking type of exercise, it's the desktop type of benchmarking exercise. Okay, thank you very much.